Welcome to a brand new year, time to set some goals and miserably fail most of them. I'm only half kidding. So one of my new year's resolutions this year is to learn how to juggle playing cards. Whoa, that's not bad. That took me like 15,000 takes. I'm really proud of that. In today's video, I wanna share with you my millionaire investing strategy for the year 2022. I'll share with you what I think will happen to stocks, real estate, and crypto. Whatever you do, please don't watch this video for financial advice because I will probably end up being wrong, just like I was wrong about thinking Bitcoin would hit $100,000. I really thought it would have last year, but it didn't, so I wanna address some of those failures in today's video. It'll be really fun to reference back to this video and say, wow, he got everything right. He should really sell an investing course. I'm just kidding, I'm not trying to sell you anything. All of the information in this video is completely free. All that I ask is that you smash the like button and please don't skip the ads. Let's get right into it. Hi, my name is Andre Jick. Hope you're doing well. Come for the finance and stay for the cool new card tricks. What's up? I'm just kidding. So first, before we get into the market prediction, like a good magician, we have to get inside of the subconsciousness of the economy itself. Now, the real reason this is important is because I just wanted to show you a cool card trick. But other than that, I think it's a really cool technique to understand how investors think. Now, in economics, there's this really cool concept called the Cantillon effect. In the 18th century, a French philosopher named Richard Cantillon published his essay on economic theory, where he noticed something really interesting. He noticed that the closer you were to power, the more you stood to benefit. In other words, if you knew rich people directly, specifically the king, then you made the most money. He also noticed that anytime there was a creation or a distribution of new money, which in that era was the discovery of a gold mine because gold was the monetary standard, that it affected people in a special way and that it was disproportionate. So a really good example is an example from Sahil Bloom who said, imagine you're living on a tiny little island and then all of a sudden at your doorstep shows up a million dollars, awesome. Most people are gonna take that money and they're going to buy themselves a new house, a new car, some clothing, a fancy watch. You get the idea. Now you would be able to buy those things at a fair market value because the island has no idea that you just got a million dollars out of nowhere. But even though now that you've distributed that money to the merchants and the people who made those things, even though now everyone has more money on the island, those people's experience is very different than your own because now everyone knows that they have more money and this creates demand. Everyone wants to buy stuff, but the supply side of things still hasn't had time to catch up with how much money everyone has. And this means the price of everything has to go up and that is inflation. So how that translates to modern economic theory is that anytime our government creates more money, like it has since March 2020, where all in we've created something like $13 trillion, it's the people at the top that are the real winners, the banks, the hedge funds and the politicians who are able to invest their money first at market values to stay ahead of that inflation curve to benefit their own wallet. It's also why we see politicians have a really impressive track record of picking just the right stocks at just the right time because they are the closest to power. So they benefit first and the most. That is the Cantillon effect. And it's also one of the reasons why I think in 2022, we'll still see inflation because there's a delay between creating money and seeing that reflect in the economy. But it doesn't mean that we can't benefit too. So with all that said, let me share with you what I think will happen to all the assets in 2022. When it comes to the stock market, here's what's really interesting. In order for investors to stay ahead of the inflation curve, they have to look for higher yielding assets. So for example, if if you keep most of your money in cash, hold on, let me convert it back to cash. Eh? If you do that, then you're essentially being taxed six to 7% per year just for holding cash. That's because of inflation. And so what people, especially in retirement will do, is they'll look for fixed income assets. Assets like dividend stocks, which are stocks that just pay you money for holding them. Now I love dividend stocks and I look for ones that are between 2% if they're growers and 4% if they're showers. What I mean by that is anything that's in the four to 5% is basically the sweet spot. Anything more than that, and it becomes maybe a little bit too risky for me. And this is especially true for people that are older and that are retired. They don't wanna take a lot of risk. But if that's the case, and inflation is 7%, if you're looking at the CPI data, then the real yield on those dividend stocks is actually negative. So you're actually losing money. 
What this does is it forces those people to look for higher risk investments. That's why we've had insane valuations in the IPO markets, in SPACs, in the metaverse, in NFTs, bored apes, crypto punks. Those are just exploding in value because investors are taking on more risk to stay ahead of that inflation curve. This is especially true for rich people like Kevin O'Leary. Everyone knows who this guy is. And as of right now, his portfolio is about 10% in crypto, which is insane because crypto is a risky, volatile asset. Why is that? Again, because he's looking for innovation, but mostly because he wants to make more money. If inflation continues to stay high, like in the six to 7% range, then I think investors will start to ditch some of those fixed income assets and low yielding bonds and commodities like gold and silver, because it's actually costing investors money to hold on to them in favor of some of the higher risk assets in the crypto space. You have to remember that there was a period of time in the 1970s when inflation was so bad that there was virtually nothing Thing you could put your money into to make money. You almost had to accept the fact that inflation was just gonna steal your money. But now we have a choice. So as far as the stock market goes, and to give you a number on it, I think the S&P 500, in other words, the VOO ETF, is going to grow by about 7%. I'm gonna be an optimist and just say that it's going to be at least 7%, which is what the stock market historically has done in a year. Now, last year, this number was closer to 30%, and it could do that again, but I will say that it's probably going to be at least 7% or closer to that number. Now, unfortunately, I can't really pick which stocks are gonna do the best, so I just buy VTI, VOO also works, and the top five holdings in this ETF are stocks like Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta, and Microsoft. And I think tech will do incredibly well next year. But again, because I don't know which stocks specifically in the tech sector, I just buy this one stock and let it ride. So that's the stock market. Now let's talk about everyone else's favorite investment, the one that millennials will probably only own in the metaverse. And that of course is real estate. Full disclosure, I'm not a real estate agent, so don't listen to what I think about real estate, but I do have a film theory. The latest data on census.gov shows that in Q4 of last year, the median home sale price was $416,000, up from $369,000 at the beginning of the year. That's an increase of about 12.7%, which is a lot when you consider that houses should grow by about 3% a year. That's four times the normal. I remember a few years ago, I was making $70,000 a year, about, and I was trying to buy a house in the $300,000 to $350,000 range, and then I remember reminding myself, Andre, what are you doing shopping for $300,000 homes? You can't afford this. Nowadays, the median household income is $71,000 a year, and homes are selling for $400,000. How long is that gonna last? I don't know, but in October of last year, 83% of properties that closed sold in less than a month. So if you listed your house for sale, it would have just been absorbed in less than 30 days, which is crazy. Again, how long is that going to last? Probably as long as inventory is low and rates are artificially suppressed. Now here's something else that's really interesting that I recently learned. You know how everyone's like, nah, Papa Powell's gonna increase our interest rates, but he's not actually responsible for those rate increases as much as they are tracked by the yield on a 10-year treasury bond. So here's a way of thinking about it. You're a bank, right? You have lots of money. You wanna invest that money, but you don't want to take a huge risk because you don't wanna lose customer deposits, but you also wanna make a profit because you're a bank. What do you do? you start lending that money out to credit worthy people. So the question is, what rate would you lend at? And how would you even know? You would know by looking at the safest investment you can make right now, which is by parking your money into treasury bonds, which is basically lending money to the government. Now, right now, the yield on a 10 year treasury bond is 1.43%. So the question is, would you lend your money to people at 1.43%? No, of course you wouldn't, because you can make a guaranteed return on your money right now by giving it to the government. Now instead, you would wanna charge people a premium for taking on the risk that those people might not pay you back. So that's why our yield or our interest rate on mortgages will never be below what the yield on a 10-year treasury bond is. 
I hope that makes sense. I know that's super complicated, but just press the J button on your keyboard to go back 10 seconds. It still probably won't make sense, I'm sorry. Now, as I'm sure you've already heard, Papa Pell wants to increase the interest rates three times. At least that's what 10 of the FOMC members have told us they would try to do this year. In theory, each increase should be about 0.25%. So if we have three of those, that is 0.75%. Now, here's what I learned about today that I didn't know about before. Whenever you increase the federal fund rate, which is what Papa Powell is trying to do, that does not guarantee an increase to the bond yield. The bond yield might go up and it might not. There's no guarantee because remember, the Federal Reserve doesn't set bond rates. It can only try to adjust them in the form of buying or selling them from the market. In this case, they wanna sell bonds because by selling, you drop the price. And because price is inversely correlated to yield, whenever the price drops, the yield goes up, which is why in theory, the mortgage rate should also go up. It gets insanely complicated, that's not the point of this video, but a good way of thinking about it is that for every 1% increase to the bond yield, home prices should technically drop by about 10%. So if we translate that to the actual price of homes, then the home prices should go from the $416,900 they are today down to best case scenario, 10% off of that, which would be about $375,200 or so. Now, short of a total crash, that's about as cheap as I think home prices will go this year, which means I'll be stuck buying homes in the metaverse. Now, here's the catch. Some investors believe that even if the worst happens and we increase the rate by a whopping 1% and the average mortgage interest goes from 3.2 up to 4.2, that that will still be historically a low mortgage rate. And between all the demand from all the millennials and the low housing supply, that even if millennials can't afford to buy the dip, then wealthy hedge funds and other international investors will scoop in to buy the dip. So even if the market drops, it'll still probably be absorbed relatively fast. So as far as my real estate prediction in terms of numbers goes, I think the median home price will go up by seven to 10%. I think the median home price will go from $416,000 that it's at right now, up to 446,000 to $458,000 on the high end. Beyond just the interest rate increase, it all depends on the jobs, the demand, and the wage increase, of course. I really wish it did, but I don't think real estate will slow down much this year. So now let's talk about crypto. Here we go again. I think Bitcoin will hit $100,000, just like I said last time. Don't listen to me. <laughs> but this year, hopefully, we will get the approval of a spot ETF of Bitcoin. We have a futures ETF, but that's kind of lame, and that's not really helping us that much. But this year, I hope that Ethereum will get its own futures ETF, in which case it'll help Ethereum. But as far as Bitcoin goes, regulators like Gary Gensler are still rejecting those ETFs. If they approve it though, mom and dad, grandpa, grandma will be able to own Bitcoin indirectly through their mutual funds, their IRAs and 401ks and trillions will flow into Bitcoin, in which case within a few weeks, Bitcoin will hit $100,000, but a lot is riding on the spot ETF. Now, as far as Ethereum goes, which is my second largest holding, a lot of it is riding on the migration to proof of stake, which is not guaranteed to happen. But if it happens and the rate of creation on Ethereum gets cut by 90% and it finally becomes a deflationary coin, we could see the price triple to $10,000 per coin which is actually not as impossible as you might think, because remember, Ethereum has historically trailed Bitcoin by about a factor of 10. So if Bitcoin can hit $100,000 when the spot ETF gets approved, it's not impossible for Ethereum to hit one-tenth of that, which is $10,000. Now, of course, the opposite could happen, and we could go back down to the highs of the last cycle. That's why instead of trying to time it, I just buy a little bit at a time every single day. So now let me try to explain something that's kind of complicated and seemingly random, but I promise it ties into everything together called the inverted yield curve. So let me just quickly try to explain what an inverted yield curve means because it's important in that it's been somewhat of a reliable predictor for recessions in the past. I'm gonna put you to sleep in this next part, but I'll do my best not to. So we have different kinds of bonds that mature at different stages. For example, we have two year, three year, five year, seven year, 10 year, 20 year, and 30 year bonds. If you buy a bond from the treasury that matures in two years, the interest rate that it'll pay you is lower than if you were to buy a bond that matures in 30 years. 
That makes sense because if you were to lock up your money with the government for 30 years, you're taking on more risk because who has any idea what's gonna happen in 30 years? We don't know. We might know in two, but not in 30. So the higher the risk, the higher the reward. In a normal yield curve, the graph just looks like an ascending left to right diagonal line. Now this tells investors that everything is normal, the economy is expanding, everything is growing, everything is perfectly fine. But if this curve inverts and we get a sloping downward curve, that means that the shorter term bonds will yield a higher interest than the long term ones. And this can signal to investors that, wait a minute, things are scary, we have no idea what's gonna happen, and so investors start to hold on to their money. The capital velocity slows down, people become pessimistic, and this could signal to investors that a coming recession is going to happen. It's predicted nine of the recessions that have happened since 1955. In the year 2021, the yield curve flattened, and now we're expecting that the recovery is gonna be slower, and we're expecting inflation to be higher. So investors are pessimistic, which is why that curve is kind of flattened, and some people are worried that if we inflect to the negative downward, so it inverts, that that could signal to investors again that another recession is coming. But one thing I do wanna get out of the way is that right now the yield curve is not telling us that there will be a recession, it's just something to pay attention to. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to have a wonderful day, smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, go grab up to $250 worth of free Bitcoin with this BlockFi link right here, blockfi.com forward slash Andre, get your free stocks, links down below, and then go track them automatically with a spreadsheet link down below in my Patreon. Love you, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you back here on Monday and Friday, sometimes Wednesday. I'll see you soon, bye-bye.